Here to help me today and got two fabulous guests. Well, I was actually going to call her the doyen of New Zealand writers. But then, <laughs> but then I realised I didn't actually know what doyen meant, so I looked it up in the dictionary. And it's actually a type of pear. So if Lee doesn't mind being called a soft fruit, that's cool with me too. And uh, I guess she's best known as the wonderful lady of horror. Of course, it's Lee Murray. And over on the other side of the virtual room, she's known and loved by Latopians and YouTube viewers alike from Spain. It's the fabulous Annie Summerlee. Oh, look, we have an endorsement fresh in. I love fresh endorsements. This is Madarika. I remember Madarika's submission, actually. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, says Madarika, for having me on his show. It was a wonderful experience. That's nice to know. I also wanted to request you to thank Mr. Cox. That was, that was me. I'm not used to being called Mr. Cox. <laughs> On my behalf for giving me such a gracious and generous endorsement on the show. I'm truly grateful. That's nice. Well, we, we aim to please, but we also aim to tell the truth as well. Let's have a look at the top five so far this month. And um, Becky, Becky Rush's our market historical fiction is still in pole position. Stonkingly good 83, actually. You know, you know what? Most of these submissions were the very first show of the month. Often is the case. I don't know why. And followed closely by A.B. Khan's speculative noir, psychological horror. We all enjoyed that. And then two tying in the third spot, women's fiction from Lucia Caste and Izzy Arcolo's Weird and Atmospheric Wolf. That one completely stays with me. Um, now, that's going to be a hard number to beat. 83 out of 100. In fact, I know that Becky got several... 100 scores from our judges too but you never know you never know it's entirely possible that this will be the show that beats that 83 let's stick around and find out <laughs> And here we go, our very first submission of the day. It's called Billionaire. It's a love story. Oh, it's nice. There's a QR code there too, so if you'd like to scan that on your mobile phone, then you'll go to whatever corner of the internet Rosie wants to take you to. And it's written by Rosie, Rosie George, and I'm going to read you Rosie's blurb. Interior designer and art therapist Jody is asked to revamp the interior of her friend's new gallery acquisition and finds herself faced with her wealthy ex, Greg, from years ago. And, well, she doesn't know it, he's in need of her help when he blames himself for his sister's suicide. He uses the designs of the gallery that he's a partner in as an excuse to get close to her again. Will she help him? find peace and will their love rekindle i can't wait let me tell you about rosie um i live at home in yorkshire everybody does at the moment not yorkshire but home uh, with my husband youngest daughter horses dogs and cat um, i'm an it project manager in my day job with first degree and a phd uh, I've written for most of my life, but only in the last few years have I committed myself to writing seriously. I run a successful writer's retreat. That might be the uh, the link, actually. Writersretreatuk.co.uk. Um, as an avenue, that provides me with a good outlet for promoting books. Hmm. I wonder what happens in a writer's retreat. Um, maybe you should spill the beans on that. My youngest daughter is transgender, and I try to bring equality and positive inclusion into everything I write. I just received an offer from a traditional publishing contract for my first love story novel. That's fabulous. Very promising. I think you need a reading from Bev, don't you? Yes, you do. Untitled by Rosie George Jodie stepped gracefully out of the taxi as Sam held the door open, taking her hand like a proper gentleman. She was grateful because her red patent leather heels were a good three inches high, and she wasn't entirely convinced she could keep them straight on the gravel drive. Her tight knee-length dress restricted her movement, so she had to swing both legs out together. The mansion before them stood proud, stretching out well beyond the width of the drive, marbled columns to each side of the entrance at the top of rolling steps that looked like a mountain to Jodie in these shoes. Should have worn something more practical, she told herself, but then the effect of accentuating her already long legs and shapely curves would have been missed, and today was a day she needed every one of her assets on full show. The spring evening air was filled with the scent of roses and peonies from the manicured flower beds 
that surrounded the oval gravelway at the end of the drive, and dusk had not yet settled into place. This home-warming party was to be a lavish affair, with a whole array of rich and famous guests, but there was one person she was particularly keen to see, Greg Kirkland, who with all his millions was still single. Not that she was interested in that way, of course. He'd had his chance six years ago, and that ship had well sailed. She was keen, though, that he could see just what he'd been missing out on for those intervening years, though. No harm in flaunting that in his face. Inside the grand hallway, the house was milling with people and the buzz of conversation filled the air. Jodie and Sam made their way over to the doorway on the far right of the lobby, her arm linked gently in the crook of Sam's elbow. A waiter held out a silver tray of champagne flutes, and they each took one, sipping as they walked on. Hmm, he was a bit tasty, said Sam, quietly into Jodie's ear. You keep your eyes to yourself, my friend. You're my date tonight, she said with a giggle. Sam downed his champagne and whispered to Jodie that he was going to get them another. Jodie suspected he was more interested in the waiter than the drinks, and nodded her agreement, before heading on to the centre of the party. Jodie was excited to see her best friend Sandra again. It had been a while. Her invite to the party tonight had also come with the news that Greg Kirkland was in town, here to do some business with Sandra's husband, Mark. They were taking over a respected art gallery in the city, a place where Jodie had dreamed of exhibiting, though that would never happen because her own paintings never saw the light of day. Sandra was at the door to the large reception room. That was the main hub of the party, waiting to greet her, looking as glamorous as ever, in a sleek, long, navy, sequined silk dress. I thought that was you, said Sandra, throwing her arms around Jodie and giving her a hug. What do you think? asked Sandra releasing her friend and gesturing to the sheer opulence around her. It's simply amazing, replied Jodie. Mark really has done well for himself. Partnering with Greg was really a great decision. He's here, you know, said Sandra, with a cheeky wink. Oh, really, replied Jodie, trying hard to inject surprise into her tone. Of course she knew he would be here. Yes, really. And I think he will be super impressed to see you looking, well, a million dollars. Those heels... They're surely new. Where's your sensible flats? I broke from tradition, just for you. But the knowing smile on her friend's face told her Sandra was believing none of it. You look fabulous and he won't be able to miss you in that dress. Whether he does or he doesn't is immaterial to me. But Jodie was struggling to believe that herself, so was sure Sandra wouldn't. AI, as you'll see in a moment, they have been having quite an interesting conversation about porridge um, and how to formulate it. I think that's entirely Annie's fault, actually. Actually, no, it's oh, not, sorry. is it? Yeah, it's, no, it's actually Lee who started that. And then we're talking about uh, milk and sugar. Some people like golden syrup. Um, some people, including myself, like just salt and water. And Johnny says, salt and water, do you live in a prison? <laughs> <laughs> That's the original recipe. But then, yeah. The, like, yeah, thanks for backing me up on that, Annie. But then everybody started to get quite interested in in your submission, Rosie, which I'm, I'm pleased to say, otherwise it would not have been great. Um, so so you will find occasional references to porridge in, in, in the chat room that we're looking at at the moment. Um, and I just needed to explain that to you. Um, Martin said something interesting there. A charm to the writing, he says, but perhaps start with a coming to face to face with Greg. Lots of scene settings, says Steve. And mine says, and having to, us having to guess the reason for the tension. Steve says, no story. Hannah says, at the end, oh, I'm a bit bored. I wonder what Annie thought of that. Well, uh, first of all, the title I'm not really a fan of. I think it's, I don't think it would stand out because especially if it's in the romance genre, there's probably a million books with billionaire in the title yeah um i think the blurb was quite like the blurb did did its job mm. so i think that was good but then um the beginning kind of there was maybe too much um backstory a bit too much info dumping i think that the setting itself would be quite interesting if we could just like maybe see a bit more of the party or get a tiny bit more action 
because in those like few moments where we just have the character when we have her interacting with other people I found her quite interesting yeah. because she clearly had like a personality and yeah. I think that there is like a, a voice coming through but obviously it's just weighed down a little bit by all the, the yeah it is it is, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah, Annie, uh, make sure you press that vote button, please, yeah. so we, we can get your numbers. Uh, Lee, first reactions. Oh, my first reaction is I want to go to um, um, Rosie's writing retreat. That sounds like lots of fun. And congratulations, yeah, Rosie, yeah. on <laughs> on the uh, traditional um, publishing deal, which is just a just a huge deal in in the current in the current. Uh, um, market, yeah, fantastic to, to grab one of those. So congratulations. Um, this this is really on genre. You know, it's it's exactly the beginning of your romantic comedy. You know, it's it's the swanky party and the champagne and the tight dress and and the the posh. You know, the posh environment. Just the sort of thing that we want to see in a rom com because we, it, you know, it's not our real life. Yeah. So I think you're really on genre there. Um, I'm just not seeing, just as Annie said, I'm just not seeing anything that's just quite bringing it out of the ordinary that doesn't make it just another yeah. another yeah. rom-com. That, that, um, and the, the writing is just that little bit tally the she told herself, which, you know, try and take those reflexive out reflexes out of your writing if you can and that little bit of info dumping between the two friends I, I don't think that you would say those things to your friends because you already know those things so you know so that it's just a little bit a little bit info yeah. dumpy there so tightening that that sort of thing up and just giving it a little bit of a zing um maybe as uh, someone in the chat said maybe start with that awkward encounter at the yeah, event rather idea, than the sort of yeah. setup. Yeah. Um, but but I think it has lots of promise. Um, it just okay. just needs that little bit of something to give it that um, point of difference at this point. Yeah. Hannah says, I, I want a reason to be interested in her wanting to make this billionaire other than the money. Do you need more? Do you yeah. really? Do you need more reason? <laughs> uh, didn't the story start when we learned she was to make Yeah, it's just what um, what, you, what you were saying there, Lee. Gladwell says we'd benefit from trimming and an injection of action. That's right. And maybe if you, I don't know, let's be radical here, Rosie, for a moment. Maybe a few more paragraphs, do you think? I don't know. That's kind of a, a, that was a, someone else on the genius room reacted exactly the same way as I did and thought, oh my God, this is a huge lump of text to digest, actually. So take it a bit easier on the reader there, please. Um, Lee, let's just see if your numbers have come through. You've got to press that vote button. Put the numbers in oh, and then. Yeah, you've got to press the, the vote button after you've, you've given the star ratings. So we'll it just says, have a look. got it. Okay, well, it'll it'll be processing. There we are, and yes, indeed, absolutely, I can see your numbers. So, it looks like Rosie, you've got a solid fifty-two to start our show today. That may vary a little bit. It might go up. It might go down. Possibly, as more and more people in the genius room exercise their right to vote. Um, yeah, it just changed that actually. You see, the, the bang it actually went up to thirty-two. But the genius room obviously is not very happy with the commercial potential. Actually, he's kind of. From my point of view, I also just gave it a 40 in terms of bang because it's not that different. It is very genre writing, but, you know, to get an agent involved, it's got to be genre plus a bit more. That's how the cookie crumbles. Sorry about that. Uh, but a solid start, I think. A solid start there, Rosie. <laughs> and here we go. Submission number two. Leah. Leah. Is it about fishing? I hope not. No, it's a thriller with occult overtones. It's from Angelica. Enormously complex uh, QR code there too. I don't know, I don't sometimes I wonder if those really complex ones do scan properly. Perhaps someone will have a go and let me know actually. I'd also like to know where it's going. Because we just put these things up. I have no idea where they're going. Could we going oh, I don't know. Venezuela. This is Angelica's blurb. I heard he's not playing with the full deck anymore. Jaded hitman Eddie McPherson wants out. Just one last contract. A key witness in a banking case? Make it look like an accident. Eddie falls in love with a woman and becomes convinced that this is a case of mistaken identity. 
but his shadowy client is determined to have her killed. And if Eddie won't oblige, there are plenty who will. Eddie must draw on his very particular set of skills, and getting away with murder is just one of them. Let me tell you about Angelica. Born in North Germany, came to London ages ago to study at the London School of Economics, fell in love with England, never went home. Fully anglicised now, I dream in English. That's, that's, a, that's a sign, isn't it? You dream in, in the language that you, as a, your adopted country. I, start, I remember doing that when I started first to dream in, in, in French. I was trying to learn French. I couldn't understand a word they were saying. That's <laughs> true, actually. Uh, this is my first novel. I wanted to write a compelling thriller with a dark and deadly secret at the centre and a supremely evil, powerful adversary. All of this without a superhumanly clever detective and weird coincidences that strain credibility. And a happy ending for the lovers, of course. That sounds like a, a classic uh, thriller, really, doesn't it? So you probably want a classic reading. Call for Barbara. Le by Angelica Klusmeyer, read by Barbara. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can do it. Excuse me. It just sort of feels wrong. The man smiled at Eddie. Let's face it, you've done a lot worse for a lot less. Well, he takes one to no one. And that's putting it mildly, Mr Bond. Eddie smiled. He liked the man, strangely enough. He had been doing business with him a few times and found him agreeable and pleasant. Generous, too. He didn't know his real name, of course. Whenever he had to get in touch about anything, he had been given an unlisted number and told to ask for Phil Sampson, which obviously meant that whatever the man's name was, it wasn't that one. The man always wore a smart black suit with blue shirt and tie, a pale gold wedding ring on his left hand. Odd that. He looked just too immaculate and well-groomed to be married. Eddie thought, he looks like a perfectly genuine, dedicated businessman. I wonder what's in it for him. Why does he do it? He wanted to ask, but decided against it. The man went on. You're well into double figures. Maybe treble, aren't you? I mean, Iraq, Helmand... You probably lost count of how many, and you've been busy since, to put it mildly. So, what's the problem? Eddie pursed his lips. But never any women or kids, the man said. Well, take it or leave it. I mean, I went out on a limb to get this for you. I wish I hadn't now. Why do they want her dead? That's a long story, and one which doesn't concern you. It'd make it easier for me. I'm sure it would, but I'm afraid a hundred grand will just have to do. They were sitting in a private booth in the Journeyman pub, just off Chancery Lane in London, two middle-aged men, one a lot smarter and slightly older than the other one, perhaps a wealthy client engaging a designer or a consultant. It was early afternoon and the bar was all but deserted. The young bartender was polishing the counter and cleaning the taps between reading the lunchtime paper. The low hum of traffic noise was drifting in from the streets and dust motes were dancing in the sunlight streaming through the stained glass windows showing pictures of the ancient trades. I have to think about it. No, you don't. For that money, I can get someone else in a heartbeat. Though, to be fair, the client is particularly keen on you for some ungodly reason. You're just saying that. No, God's honest truth. They just love your portfolio. They do? Yes, and you look the part. They love a handsome devil. I mean, who doesn't? You're such a talented boy. They both laughed. Here, let me get you another drink. The bartender caught the man's eye and came over. What can I get you? Eddie? An absinthe, please. Now, now, the man smiled. It's not that bad, is it? The bartender said, I think we've run out. Let me check. Yes. Would a Jägermeister do? A Jägermeister always does. Actually, make that too. Eddie thought, how can someone like him be so handsome and charming? Was there no justice in the world? Perhaps he was the visual equivalent of the devil having all the best tunes. This man was evil, personified, the spark that lit the fuse. Unlike him, who just did as he was told, he had very little choice in the matter, as failing to deliver on a contract was really not an option. Eddie sometimes wondered what would happen if he did fail to deliver a contract, but not for long. Look, this is really easy. It's not meant to look like a message, a warning, a statement, none of that nonsense. They just need her taken out of the equation. Why? Is she dangerous? Perhaps she's threatening someone? No, as far as I know, she's just a bit of a nobody. 33 unmarried. Works in a bank. All right. Uh, excellent scene setting. Let's just see what uh, Martin said there. Excellent scene setting, although dialogue perhaps going on too long. I think that's been very generous, actually, Martin. 
Um, my own feeling is that we, uh, yeah, I think Johnny's there as well, actually, that we've got first two submissions are not doing themselves any favour at all because of poor formatting. And it's not that difficult. Someone else on the genius room said, just Google it. I mean, there's, you know, I feel ashamed about doing a seminar on that or something, really, because it's just it's fairly basic stuff. But it's so important how people react to your submission. There's, it's determined, uh, to, to some extent, at least, quite a significant extent, by just how difficult it is to read. You imagine yourself reading through 25 submissions, you know, on an afternoon, you really just want to get home or something. And, you know, you get two or three coming and looking kind of, oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I can bother. Really doesn't put people in the right um, right frame of, um, of mind. Um, let's see what Lee thought of that. You know, Peter, I'm going to say exactly what you've just said, and you, that's just not going to get off the get off the slush pile because mm. um, the formatting is, is going to put you off. And, you know, use a serif... Um, font it makes it much easier for Absolutely. your poor agent who's reading 75 submissions a day to, yeah. to, to stand out from the crowd get those get those dialogue get that dialogue um, properly formatted it makes a huge difference but you know um, Angelica it's the blurb is great I love the title um, the, the blurb is great it's right on genre you're 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 missing just a little bit of detail i really wanted to know what those special skills were that that eddie had the the hit man it sort of just didn't give me it just felt a little generic it, i mean it's on genre which is what you want but it's just a little too generic to stand yeah. out and make it sound any different um barbara did a lovely job of reading it um but i and and you i got a bit of a feel for the voice he just felt a little stilted uh your your hit man and there are some issues with your there are some issues with the, the, the plotting in the sense that, you know, how much information does a hitman get? You know, I kind of think they'd be sort of shady and sort of maybe get in an envelope and I don't know, or on a disc or something. But all this talk is, is it just seems like it's setting him, setting yeah. him up to be, you know, caught. Uh, yeah, you know, it does and, a bit, and, actually. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to you know. know. Yeah. That's a really good point. That would give some veracity. I mean, how much information yeah, the, does a hitman want? Actually? Look, Peter, the hitmen I've spoken to, they don't do that. <laughs> they just don't do that. You know, uh, just a little bit of a worry about, you know, does that is that plausible, I think. And, and um, I think that that's a little bit more of a, a quieter profession than you probably would have your photo yeah, out there right. and so yeah. so there's a little bit to, to look at maybe take things like dust motes out of the out of the equation so that little bit of description and keep the description on genre so you know yeah. it's it just might be a siren blast somewhere or something else that's just definitely have some detail but not necessarily the kind of detail that you've got yeah got here so Fabulous. I'll put Thank some numbers you. in. <laughs> Good. That's just what we need. Johnny in the, in the uh, genius room says, Hitman on one last job. It's a bit of a well-worn trope. It totally is, isn't it? Mind you, works for Hollywood. Probably can work for you, Angelica. Let's see what Annie thought. Yeah, I agree with um, what's been said so far. Um, there, there was too much description, and uh, I, I just felt like in the very first paragraph, you've got this chance to stand out and it was it was used for like to describe this other guy who I'm assuming probably won't matter that much because he's not even the client he's just kind of the middleman and yeah. um, I thought that the very last line the 33 unmarried works in a bank I think that would be a good place to start because yeah. what we've heard up mm. until now doesn't really doesn't really do anything and um, what else was there yeah, there was one thing that actually came up that I thought would be interesting to explore a little bit more or find out if it's if it makes sense or not because he was saying that, you know, this guy is very evil and he's, um, he's very evil but then he himself, he doesn't really see himself that way and he's saying that he doesn't feel like he's got choice which is kind of strange if he's being paid um, like a very yeah. big lump sum of money. So if, if someone's yeah. forcing him to be a hitman, they probably wouldn't pay him. Yeah, so, a good point. Like there, there's there's a kind of disconnect there. So if he feels like he doesn't have free will but is still accepting money, I think I mean that's an interesting thing to explore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah. Um, John in the uh, genius room says, don't, don't meet in public. These, these uh, The genius room is putting together a, a sort of a list for would-be hitmen now, what to do and what not to do. And John says, don't meet in public. And definitely don't <laughs> chat to the bartender. I think that's good advice, actually. Yes. Uh, Martin, great tip from me about selecting the detail appropriate to the genre. Absolutely right. And the thing is also, you know, we're going on, a, well, you might say, oh, this one, Peter Cox is going on about formatting and stuff. But if you do format, a, you know, expand this a bit, both both you, Angelique and, and Rose as well, then you will actually, it, make, it makes it much easier to find the words you don't need, actually. And you just take them out, take them out. And only write the words that uh, readers want to read. Okay, so let's look at the numbers there. 53, Angelica. Just pipped at the moment. Just pipped Rosie, I think, by one. We'll have a look at comparative score in a moment. Um, so that's a good start for you too. What else do we need to say about that? I, lo I loved it. I loved it when Lee said Seraph. Yes, Seraph, absolutely. You know what? Should we speak to Lee now? I think we ought to. So catch up with Lee. Heavens, heavens <laughs> above, look at that. Tortured Willows, bent, bowed, unbroken poetry. I see your name there, Lee. This is, this is, you are so busy. I can't believe how much you get up to. <laughs> when is this coming out? <laughs> Um, 7th of October and it's my first poetry collection oh, and I, I'm super excited. These are the, these are the, uh, my Crane sisters from Black Crane's Tales of Unquiet Women, which has gone on to just be, do amazing things. It, it's won the Shirley Jackson Award since I last spoke mm. to you as well as the Bram Stoker. Mm. So it's been, um, an amazing book. And so this is a follow up to Black Crane's, um, and we're just re, we're, you know, exploring those, those themes again, but through poetry and wow it's just been a bit life-changing for me this particular book so really? very exciting i can't wait oh nice that's mm. fabulous that's fabulous i just want to i mean you know you're a, a regular i mean you're one of the star attractions let's face it pull up submissions <laughs> but I want, I want to ask you a basic question that i've never actually asked you and that is uh, who encouraged you to write in the first place and how did you you know start to get the confidence together to actually get published get the confidence well you know oh. i've always been a scribbler and um you know my dad used to tell me stories when he was you know when i was a teeny little tyke and he would he actually taught me story crafting you know we would go for road trips um my family lived a long way from the extended family so we would go for long tr long trips and there were four of us in the car and he would hmm. keep us entertained with these stories oh, and wow. it was He'd pretend he'd ha he'd bring in a character like one of my cousins and say, and then tell the story of the cousin trying to taste the car, and um, you know, and my cousin would be you know running through goat goat sheds and or washing lines and trying yeah. to catch us up, and he would throw these. Um, what do you call them? Uh, just just obstacles in the way, and the character would have to overcome them. And it was brilliant story oh, crafting, really, because that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. That's so, before, before um, but actually, your, your father was exactly, a talking, walking good old dad. Book. How brilliant! How brilliant. <laughs> he was. Yeah. So, yeah. and then my husband said, "It's time you stopped talking about it and just did it." When the children were small, and and yeah. I was at home, so I had the opportunity. I was very lucky, and so and I did. You are sort of known as the first lady of horror in, in New Zealand. Oh, I mean, thank how, you. How, how did you gravitate? Well, it's just truth. It's fact. It's not not even a compliment. It's just the truth. Um, how did you gravitate towards that? That's kind of strange, isn't it? You Actually. <laughs> No, well, it is because, you know, I, I fell into that whole edge of write what you know, which is kind of scary because we've just been reading about an assassin. But, you know, um, write what you know. And so I uh. wrote this chiclet book about marathon running because it used to be a bit of a marathon runner back in the day and uh, when I was young. And um, and it was fun. It was great fun. And I learned a lot of things from that book. Please don't go reading it. Go off and find it. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, but that. I realized that I... <laughs> That I wanted to, um, I wanted to write about things that were sort of more that resonated a bit more for me, not just cupcakes. Yeah. I, I yeah. love the genre; it's great fun, but it was it, it wasn't for me. So, so I wanted to think, address sort of more if you think darker about, themes. If you think about the typical horror writer, I've got to say most people would think male. So it's it's unusual. I think maybe it's, I'm just talking about my prejudices in public. It's on. It's more unusual to find a female horror writer. Is there more pressure on you? Do, is do, is is you know? Is the general feeling you've got to be better than than a male writer just to hold your head above water in that area? 
Uh, yeah, um, there is a perception that women can't write horror, and and that's just that's just a perception. And there are lots of women in horror. I think part of the problem is that there's just not enough publishers, you know, who are mm. also women who are interested in horror, perhaps, or you know, it's representation, isn't it? It's just harder for women to 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 make traction within the publishing industry. It's harder to be seen. We're not we're not. We're not perceived as being horror writers, and when you're a little Asian yeah. girl, that doesn't yeah. that doesn't help either. So, yeah, I guess it is a little bit harder. But then also, I, I have a point of difference. You know, people know me for being this this little Asian girl who writes horror. So maybe that that helps. I, I don't yeah. I don't know. It's a tricky yeah. one, isn't it? You just it have to find your niche. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, write not, what but, resonates yeah. for you. Yeah. So, zombie horror has kind of had its day, maybe. Well, it'll come back in 10 years' time. What's What's the next big trend, do you think, in horror? Oh, I don't know. I don't really follow the trends. I think that it, it shows if you don't love what you're doing. Mm. Um, it shows in the writing. So, so if you're just writing to be commercial, look, I, I think there's still space for zombies. I definitely think there's still a place oh, for zombies. It's that's just, lovely. It's just how you approach it. You just need to subvert it, you know, and do something a little different with it. And and I'm sure, yeah, no, I, I don't think zombies are going anywhere, and especially not now no, in a pandemic well, when they are, they're a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're just a metaphor for 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 the for pandemic friction aren't yeah, they really, zombies really, so really. you know yeah. um i don't see them going anywhere in a hurry yeah and i, I mean yeah, obviously we're, we're oh, no, that's a pun isn't it yeah, it totally, it totally is. Yeah, yeah. To stagger <laughs> she puns without knowing it. Uh, so, what about what about the whole New Zealand thing? Then, I mean, is is I'm still kind of waiting for you know New Zealand noir to take over the world. Problem is, the perception of New Zealand is is, is sort of island paradise and a and a sea of um, pandemics, isn't it? Really, I mean, I guess we're a bit un, unrealistic about New Zealand. We still think about New Zealand as Lord of the Rings country. Um, I think part of the problem in New Zealand is being a speculative writer. There are no publishers here, and, mm. and so getting print books into bookstores and libraries is really, really difficult, and it just becomes, it just prices us out of the market. So most of us are, you know, um, work operating in the Kindle environment, um, you know, Audible, that kind of thing, yeah. just simply because we just can't get our books in front of, uh, in, yeah. in, into bookstores here. So that's, it's kind of a logistics issue. We're a long way away. Paper costs money, delivery costs money, that kind of thing. You know, there's a there's a kind of an old joke here in New Zealand. That, you know, it costs five dollars to buy, and and then it costs a hundred dollars to get it delivered to New yeah, Zealand. Really. You know, whatever you purchase, <laughs> the postage yes. packaging is a hundred dollars. You know, so that's the problem for us down here in New Zealand. Oh, I mean, um, it may not just be your problem. The way infrastructure is going here in the UK, it's probably going to be exactly the same here soon. Except we don't get the fantastic landscape. Uh, you better stop now, Lee, because I've got so much I want to ask you. But we'll cover cover everything else. Another that I want time, to ask you I'll next. be back. Yeah, I'll next be back. time, absolutely. And in any case, we've got three more submissions. When you join our weekly huddle, certain things happen. No, not that. Bring your writing, your book titles, your blurbs, anything really, for expert and sympathetic input. In confidence. Other websites charge a fortune for this kind of thing. In Latopia, the oldest community for writers on the net is included in your modest subscription. Latopia, we're here for you. Here we go. Submission number three. Major's call. Ooh. I say, Dart is with us. This is our author, Dart Armran. Yes, it's great to have the authors along live on YouTube. Don't be nervous. Good heavens. What have you got to be nervous about other than being rejected? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding with you. It's fantasy. Mage is called QR code, and this is Dart's blurb. The four wizard discipline power sources dwindle. As powerful mages vanish in a wave of destruction, is there a connection? Mara intends to find out. Her mentor and adopted grandfather are among the missing mages, and she won't give up until she finds him. Mara enlists a reluctant Reese to embark on a perilous adventure. Along the way, they collect clues, allies, and enemies. Not the mention face, not, I think that should be not to mention facing monsters and demons. All while discovering their relationship is 
more complicated than expected. It's a bit of a Facebook relationship. Let me tell everybody about you, Dart. Um, I'm I, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Stand by, everybody. I'm an artificial intelligence enhanced robotic probe <laughs> sent by extraterrestrials to analyse and assess the development of humanity. <laughs> just kidding i'm not sure you are kidding actually one of these days we will get a total ai submission I, um, what do we do then actually i don't know uh, but now you have a glimpse of what people around me have to put up with says dart when i'm not reading immersed in video games or managing a chaotic household i'm writing science fiction fantasy and even the occasional paranormal horror story right up lee street what led to all this madness in part a childhood crammed with reading books written by authors like isaac Asimov, arthur c clark and terry brooks classics but also i served 22 years active duty in the u.s air force in technical career fields which added even more fuel to my science fiction and fantasy mind machine that's me in a nutshell and your reading in a very well organized nutshell is going to come from Jeff. Made his call by Dart, read by Jeff. Eric glared at the staff, willing it to do something, anything. Blasted piece of fell wood. I spend countless hours searching for you, weeks shaping you into perfection, months imbuing you with the wizard's touch, and this is how you repay me. If he was surprised by a lack of response, he didn't show it. In fact, Eric went on cursing and demeaning the section of lumber as though it cared. Finally, he ceased to rate and snatched a large crystal from the middle of the staff. The moment he did, it collapsed on itself, becoming nothing more but a pile of wood chips. Ulrich held the crystal before his aged blue eyes, squinting in consternation. It isn't the wood, is it? It never was the wood, it was you. The crystal remained as still as the wood, as though they'd formed a pack of silence. Despite his anger, Ulrich walked over to an anoint pedestal and gingerly placed the crystal within a fire globe. There. If you won't cooperate, then you can rot in satis until I decide you're worthy of my attention once again. He began to turn away, only to detect a glimmer from the corner of his eye. He faced the crystal again, a groin splitting his craggy and weathered face. So, change your mind, have you? Ulrich's hand was poised over the crystal, preparing to pluck it from its prison like a satisfied jailer when a thought occurred to him. A frown replaced his smile and he dropped his hand in disgust. Mara Winsel. A moment after grumbling the name, a soft knock came from the door. Enter, he yelled in anger, but not at Mara. It certainly wasn't her fault Crystal responded to her presence and the young slip of a girl had no idea how or why she was so sensitive to magic at all. Neither did Ulrich. Ulrich. Mara dashed across the room and embraced him. Not one to be fond of children, he laughed nevertheless and returned the hug. Besides, Mara was no child. She'd reached her 17th circle just last summer. And what brings you to an old dark and menacing spellcaster this early morn? Dark and menacing? You? Don't be silly, Mara said laughing. I noticed you didn't include old in your response. He glared at her, feigning anger, but all too soon a smirk broke out in his stony stare, and he laughed aloud as well. You're my dearest friend, Eric, but you are old. Bah, 237 circles are hardly old. I have at least twice that ahead of me, young lady. Only if the township is lucky, smiled out of him. Ulrich sensed a sincere admiration that coaxed a gentle smile out of him. Ulrich had many acquaintances in the township of Akinlaw, but none as close as Mara. Their relationship came about reluctantly. Despite their friendly banter, Mara had an intense fear of the wizard before they were even introduced some four circles ago. Ulrich had a reputation for being aloof, short-tempered, impatient, and among many, a quack, none of which the castle would have denied. For Ulrich, he wanted to be left alone. The practice of magic often required a solitary lifestyle and that suited him just fine. He had also never been very good at building relationships of any kind, particularly those involving children. Having a child of 13 thrust into his life wasn't ideal. You're too kind, my dear. Now, what brings you here? I was in the middle of a critical experiment, you know. His attempts at self-importance appeared to be lost on Mara as she walked around the room, trying in vain to avoid all the clutter. 
a little collection of scrolls and books scattered around the circular shaped laboratory that doubles as a study. Despite the floor to floor ceiling bookcases lining every wall, he habitually found himself far too busy to replace literature once removed. But the scrolls and books were a minor nuisance compared to the amount of magic related paraphernalia adorning the room. Lara couldn't avoid knocking over decanters filled with organs from exotic animals, insects, and a multitude of other strange items. Okay, let's go straight to the genius room and see what the genii are cogitating. Um, I will read to you Jeff's comment actually, because he's our narrator. I always like to hear from the narrators because they get inside the manuscript and read it and see it, see it rather differently actually. Um, but before that, Galadriel says Galadriel says Jeff reading always reminds me of being young I'm listening to Jack and Nori oh it's lovely I know what you mean listening to the likes of Bernard Crevin I know that's absolutely right it's kind of like what Lee was just talking about you know having a dad you know spontaneously give them all these wonderful stories and, and long car journeys yeah that's right you should do that jeff um okay so this is jeff's comment thank you for bringing that up um making it bigger i thought there was a good voice says jeff with an infused humor and i like the opening dialogue with the staff i could picture it happening easy to read but less exclamation marks please i'm not a fantasy reader but it seems to be a well-trodden storyline and will need something to make it stand out i think that's absolutely on the money what did you think there annie I really liked um, the humour in it. I thought it was really funny the way it started with him just shouting at this um, piece of wood. That was, I think it was like a good way to um, get her attention. And even though it's not the main character, I still think it works. Like you can expect this, um, especially if this is the character that's going to go missing, then it's quite good that we get to know him a little bit before that happens and that we see their relationship. Um, there was only one thing that I kind of have criticism for and it's um, there was this one big paragraph near the end where it was mm -hmm. all just one big info dump because yeah. I was enjoying it quite a lot and then we got oh, there right. and that, I just zoned out completely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, again, that's that's, the, that's, the that's not good. Let's go back to the genius room because there's a lot of lot of good stuff there, as always, actually. Galadriel says, I'm liking this. I think it could be trimmed a bit, but definitely has something. And I like the humour. The description of the room could be tightened so it doesn't feel tropey. And Cora says, a lot of very nice fantasy stuff in here, but a wee bit too much telling. I'd cut it back a bit. But it's drawn me in. Nice voice. Um, Johnny says the same. So you're getting, you see, nice thing about the genius room is when, when there's a consensus. I mean, that, and you know, you should take that seriously, actually. That's a general comment to anyone who makes a submission here. Sometimes you know, submissions absolutely divide people. They're riven into or more. Other times you get a general consensus coming through. And that's the, that's the time when you really need to, you know, lower the ego defenses and go, hmm, maybe they're onto something. Um, Vagabond says characters are distinct and nice, too, a bit too much telling. Martin, 17th Circle is lovely telling detail. Yeah, let's um, let's see. I mean, I've, I, I'm kind of surprised no one's mentioned Harry Potter or Terry Pratchett, but let's see what Lee made to that. Um, yeah, um, uh, I would say that the blurb was great. I might not have got past the blurb, though, with the spelling or the typo, and that's a real yeah. problem, isn't it? Because that's one of the yeah. first things you read as, as, a, as a publisher or an agent is that blurb. So I didn't get the YA feel of it. Um, it. It read to me as a sort of quite a dark, you know, didn't quite get the YA feel in that in that blurb. I mean, oh. the, fir the first top end was a little hit a little heavy with the the four wizard forces or something i can't quite recall but um yeah it just didn't quite feel that give me that sort of quirky humorous why i feel that i got when we when when jeff so so competently read the 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 extract so yeah. that's something to think about dart um the author bio mm, i don't know if i would lead with that particular sentence I, yeah, I think yeah. i would lead with the more interesting <laughs> points um well, I, exactly. you, know, you don't but, know who um, he's going to do you i mean you know for me and yeah. my weird sense of humor it tickles me because i could actually imagine an ai sending in a submission and if it got rejected that we get an instant drone strike you know but maybe <laughs> i'm just a very sick person um uh, maybe other well, people maybe would not feel the same way with 
the blurb. I mean, if, yeah. if the blurb had had that more fun, quirky feel to it, then perhaps yes. we would have accepted that. That yes. um, or because certainly the text yeah. had that quirky feel, and I did love the vocabulary. It was very much in in keeping with the genre and the story. Um, I love that fun sort of humorous vibe, and and uh, Jeff was dead right about the staff and the, the interaction with the staff at the beginning. I, I am, but my concern is when we haven't got to the inciting incident. It's in the blurb. We we, we understand that this this mentor has been whisked away somewhere, but it's not in the beginning of the book. And maybe we don't need this scene until after after yeah. the character finds out. And and she should be. She should be if this is if if the young girl is the protagonist, she should be the voice. She it should be her yeah, point of view, not his idea. point of view. Um, and I just think that that's part of the problem. It's a little bit omniscient, still a little telly. So if you can get that in her head and get it from her point of view, I think you really might be onto something here. So a bit of work to do. The world building looks like it's going to be fabulous. So um, just a little bit of work to do to get it tightened up at this point. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. That's great, great, great advice from a total pro. Uh, Darts just pointed out in the YouTube uh, chat room that it's not YA. And that, that's that's fair enough. I mean, I, I don't know how we get that impression, but it's definitely not YA. Um, okay, so oh. I, I, again, I'm kind of... I'm finding to myself saying more or less the same thing, actually, funnily enough, Darn. But um, it's okay. It's it's it feels a bit generic, and to, to, you know, to get agents, most agents, unless they just specialise in one particular genre, and certainly most publishers interested to the extent they're going to put serious money down on the table, then I would need something that just stands out that little bit more. Um, feels a little bit tropey, a little bit derivative. And the thing to remember is that you don't have to, this is what I learned as a, you know, decades ago, really, when I first went into agenting, you don't have to be that much in front of the pack. You only have to be at the most half a step. If there's, you know, if there's a trend happening, then if you're just a little bit in front of that trend, everybody will want you. Everyone will want you. And if you're a little bit behind, then uh, your commercial marketability is questionable. So it's all, it's a very fine judgment call, actually, Dart. But anyway, your good news is you're in the lead, 62. Nothing to complain about, really, is there, Dart, eh? When you join our weekly huddle, certain things happen. No, not that. Bring your writing, your book titles, your blurbs, anything really, for expert and sympathetic input. In confidence. Other websites charge a fortune for this kind of thing. In Latopia, the oldest community for writers on the net is included in your modest subscription. Latopia, we're here for you. Here we go, number four of the day. Interesting title there. I say, <laughs> we've got that's a lovely, lovely wish from Giga Chadmesh. Thank you, Giga Chadmesh on YouTube. That's wonderful. Um, I don't know what it means, but it's, it sounds very beneficent. Thank you for that. All our authors, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Dart. Very good. Very, very good to have your feedback on us too. We review you, you can review us. Uh, do subscribe if you can, please. Press that button, press the like button. The reason everybody asks that on YouTube is is because it actually helps the algorithm. It helps us get discovered. So that's why we ask and beg you to do it. This is from Andrew. It's non-fiction. We don't get much non-fiction. I love non-fiction. So I've already, you know, you've already got my attention here. And it's called Books, Booze, Bus Stops, Life in the Boarding Bubble. Alliteration or what? This is Andrew's blurb. The book is an inside account capital B. The book is an inside account of the humours and horrors of boarding school life. Focusing on my old deals of running both a boys and a girls boarding house. I'm the only person still in teaching to have done this. Losing control in the classroom at two separate schools. Con constant battles with the three B's of boarding. Booze, bullying and blatant sexism. And most recently my affair with a parent. I also reveal how boarding schools, after years of decline, reinvented themselves. They have changed, that's for sure. They have changed. Hannah likes the title already. You're onto the winner there, Andrew. Um, let me tell everybody about you. I've taught English in top schools for 30 years. 
So I know the system inside out, says Andrew. I've written regularly on education and culture for the Telegraph under my own name and as Boarding School Beak. I, hopefully that's not a, a, a non, I mean, a, you know, a pen name because we've just blown your cover there. Um, I've also written regularly for the FT, Independent and Express, and I'm a former editor of the HMC Schools magazine, Conference and Common Room. Well, you know your onions, as does our wonderful reader today, Johnny. Books, Booze and Bus Stops. Life in the Boarding Bubble by Andrew Cunningham. Read by John. I like teenagers. And I've grown up used to their ways, but every so often they still shock. At boarding schools, like other schools, teachers have form groups. The difference with boarding is that because they're at school the whole time, teachers are expected to occupy them at weekends by putting on social events. An easy option for a form evening is to book the school's sixth form centre. And that's where it went wrong. I'd warmed them up on a couple of cans of San Miguel, minimum cost, maximum buzz, we were chatting away happily about their plans for the holidays. Towards the end, approaching the 10.30 curfew, and there being no more alcohol on offer, they started to gravitate towards the pool and darts at the far end of the centre. It wasn't long before one of them came over and challenged me. Do you play pool, sir? Sort of. Let's give it a go, Hector. Engrossed in the game, which I lost with four balls to spare, I lost my bearings on what the others were up to. They were gathered round a dodge board, laughing loudly, so it must be fine. But as Hector sank the black, I looked back over at the darts again. They were taking turns to spread their hands, fingers splayed, palms inwards, against the dart board, whilst the others, chortling away, were throwing darts from the hockey. The game was not to pull one's hand away, but risk being hit by a dart. It was like being transported back to Lord of the Flies. I was shocked to sobriety. What the hell's going on? Oh, just a bit of fun, sir. No one minds. Would you like a go? At least three of them were already brandishing bloody fingers. Stop it at once, please! They did. It was another glimpse into that savage world teenagers sometimes shift into when adults aren't present or concentrating. By Monday, I just about managed to blot it out the memory. Then I had to confront the sight of one of them in my A-level class with a bandaged hand. A day later, he had to be checked out at the nearest hospital, as the dart had hit a finger joint, which became infected. I felt terrible. How could I let that happen? This was 2020, not Tom Brown's school days. Slips like that aside, I knew it was time to leave my teaching job when I had an affair with a parent. Bad behaviour, detention duly awarded. Short but sweet, tense but torrid, it was the most excitement I'd had in 30 years of teaching. However, short of breaking the ultimate taboo, having sex with a pupil, which has been known to happen, it was guaranteed career suicide and almost certainly a second offence. I'm still wondering what my fate might be should this particular example of parent-teacher meeting, PTM, come to light. It must still be a well-kept secret, otherwise my colleagues would either be tut-tutting every time they saw me, or else smirking furiously. Naturally, there's nothing specific in the school rules saying thou shalt not have sex with a parent, but it's bound to be covered by that umbrella clause in the contract. Anything that brings the school into disrepute may result in the termination of employment. So this book spills the beans and may come as a shock to the other half of the affair, for which I apologise profusely. Names, of course, will be changed. Looking back, it was always likely to happen. In the glamorous world of the boiling bubble, there are so many super fanciful, yummy mothers. Anyone who had the chance to bed one would surely be nuts to say no. But it's a pity my career as a boarding bake ended on such a deception. Up until then, it had all seemed like a glorified holiday camp. A kind of boarding butlins, only with a more upmarket clientele. Now I'd spoiled all that innocent fun. Much as I liked the boy in question, it's hard to look someone straight in the eye in the class next morning when you've just spent the night with his mother. So the uh, the chat room, the genius room, is on fire. Actually, on fire. Uh, Martin says, "Loving your voice, Johnny. You absolute classic reading, Johnny." Actually, I have to say, yeah, totally. Uh, did you do your prep after lacrosse? <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, Matt says, wait, are we starting off talking about getting a bunch of kids drunk? This is really funny. Uh, Johnny says, fun to read. Andrew made it quite story-like. Uh, Eva says, reminds me of goodbye, goodbye, Mr. Chips, does it? Um, interesting, uh, lovely humour, Suzanne Cora would read it. And then Martin says, is Johnny channeling Fazzle Brush? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, what did you make of that, Annie? Oh, I thought it was very funny. I, I, I really liked it. And I, obviously Johnny's reading just kind of <laughs> Gee, elevated it? <laughs> it even more. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was brilliant. Um, I don't think I've got any negative to say. I really like that that first scene with the the darts thing. It was just so surreal, but at the same time, just you can just believe it. Like it's obviously oh, yeah. something that must have happened because teenagers are just a bit mental. So, and and I think it's sometimes when we have nonfiction on here in pop up, sometimes they start with a lot of info dumping or like they kind of have this need to tell us what's going to be in the book but here the the author's done a very good job of giving us that like that scene and then very slowly telling us why he's writing this book the whole affair thing which when i first read the blurb i thought i thought that seemed kind of inconsequential and i was going to say maybe you don't have to put that in the blurb that you're had an affair but if that's the whole reason for him losing his job then obviously yeah I guess so. Well, yeah, but, I think yeah, I think really it is, and it, yeah, I think I think I think um, I would actually use the B word there in the title, probably bonking, books, booze, and bonking. <laughs> that well, yeah. sort of gives, gives more of a sort of basil brush feeling to it. Uh, let's just look at the the numbers there, Annie, that you've given. Oh, you haven't pressed the button yet. You haven't pressed oh, the button. No, let's yeah. see. Let's right. see how they come through. Let's look at the uh, genius room. What they're saying? They're going high. Wow, they're going high at the moment. 85. Wow. I've given it 82 for commercial potential. You've suddenly jumped up there enormously, Andrew, to 76. Let's see what Lee thought about that. Did you understand a word of it, Lee? <laughs> we <laughs> do this? have some boarding schools here. So oh, it's not just I a do, particularly British I perversion. Went. No, I actually oh, went right. to a, a girls boarding school myself. I wasn't oh, really? I wasn't a boarder. I was a day oh, girl, yeah. but um so I do understand it was actually the actual the actual um hostel was uh, was set next to a brothel, which I thought was always very oh, interesting. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> someone needs to write that story as well, right? I yeah. think that would be a great compliment to this, this to Andrew's book here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another B um, there as well. Actually, Amazing. Wow, yes. This is the alliteration <laughs> day, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. But that yeah. was a, a cle it is a clever I, I, a clever title. It does draw you in. It has that sort of Bill Bryson feel, doesn't it, this particular it does, non fiction. It does. Yeah. Um and I think that that has a great readership. People love humour. Um and this is a little bit different. I I, I actually think um yeah, I actually think that there, this has some commercial potential. I, I, I think it mm. feels a little different and something that, you know, if you did go through a, a boarding school, you might actually find enjoyable. I love I love the use of parent with a capital P in the blurb. I thought that was like, you know, the, the, uh, you, you, they who must be obeyed, the parents, you know. Um, uh, definitely the, the um, bio was fabulous. You are definitely an expert, Andrew, and that, that's great. That just gives a... Uh, gives the uh, a little bit of confidence to to the the publisher or the agent who's looking at your work yeah um i would have liked i think a little bit of an a bit of information about the setup and i guess it's part of sort of a book proposal of how are you going to you know is it just going to meander or how are you going to set this Set, you order your your book because it is non-fiction. So are you going to talk about the boys or are you going to talk about, you know, categorise the, the mothers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to – I mean, what's the setup? How's the – you know, uh, how are you going to meander through the story? What is the, the arc yes. of it? And um, so that, a little bit of information like that would certainly help, I think, the publisher Definitely. get a feel of whether this is this has got some legs. Um, yeah. But I think otherwise, it, you know, it read pretty well. And the tenses, yeah, there was a few jumps of tenses in the in the text. So perhaps check that. But otherwise, it looks like really fun. Yeah, <clears throat> Ziva say, oh, yeah, we, we might, who knows, we might get 
demonetised again. We got demonetised the other week. I don't know. I couldn't care really now what Google does. Uh, Vagabond says... <laughs> so we get it. We, it's all coming out now. Everyone's looking back to their childhood with fond reminiscences. Vagabond says there was an unwitting audio sex tape that went round our boarding <laughs> school. Gym teacher and French <laughs> mistress. You can't make it up. Or maybe she is making it up. I don't know. This is very commercial, actually. Um, Andrew, it's very commercial. Um, I've Let's just go back to that, actually, because I just look at explain my scores. Uh, t- I'm not wild about the title. Other people are. I'm not wild about the blurb. Other people are. I think I think you definitely can write. And the commercial potential, they see, I've given um, an eight to you. It's definitely there. Um, it's, a, it's either... I think you can go, go have to take a choice on, on this, really. It's either what publishing calls, very, very hot at the moment, a professional confessional, and we, we have those from all kinds of professions, uh, lawyers, obviously lots and lots of doctors and nurses doing that at the moment. But anyone really who's in the profession at the moment really wants to spill the beans. Publishers will listen hard to that. The downside of that is there are always legal issues to be thought about. And, you know, it can be a minefield. Um, things come crawling out of the woodwork legally sometimes. The other, other way to take it would be, I would, I'd personally prefer this, but, you know, it's a, it's a horse apiece, really. Um, is just to anonymise it. So, you, you know, it's not actually your name on there. By a non. And that would give you some freedom to, you know, invent composite characters, maybe. And re- you know, is, oh, is it going to suffer if we don't actually name names and name institutions? I don't think it is, actually, because it's a romp. And as Lee says, we want, we want to know the shape of the story. It's got to be a good story in each chapter. Good topic, good story. Um, but it's pretty straightforward stuff, and you really ought to get published. So I'm going big on that in terms of the commercial potential. Let's just see what else the chat room is saying. At a PT meeting, says Hannah, while sitting across the table, a father, jeweller, so we're getting some gossip here, um, opened a case with a beautiful ring in front of his daughter. We'd hardly said hello. I refused with a very hot face. It's a personal story. Oh, we've got a little a Twitter, a little Twitter. It's less than less than 240 characters. Wow, Hannah. Yeah. And uh, Eva's reference to Mr. Chips um, was picked up on um, by, I don't know who, I think it was Matt actually, saying something like, I don't, yeah, no, it's Ancora. I don't remember Mr. Chips sleeping with a pupil's parent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> And Matt says, it's Mr. Chips after dark. Fabulous. You, know, you can tell we all, we all like this. You've zoomed into the lead there, Andrew. Yet, there is one more submission. One more. Let's see what that is. For the love of B, I'm going to say B there, but I'm, I'm always slightly intimidated by that, that word. I don't know if I should be saying beer, actually. No, that's wrong. For the love of beer, that's probably quite a different book. Uh, it's YA, so it probably is for the love of B. It's by Jessica. QR code, please scan it and go. And this is Jessica's blurb. Struggling with being a fat girl in a thin world, scared of the unknown and determined to meet the father that abandoned her so many years ago, B has one hell of a summer ahead of her. Flying to Greece to join the con- the conservation of sea turtles is her only chance to find out who her dad is and why he abandoned her mum 19 years ago. Little does she know that she'll also discover the trouble that pretty boys can cause and just how hard it is to save the turtles. That sounds very promising to me. Let me tell you about... Um, it is a nice blurb, isn't it, Matt? Let me tell you about Jessica... I'm a writer and body positive influencer. Since graduating from the University of Roehampton, oh, I guess a few wild parties down there, uh, with a degree in creative writing, I've dabbled in copywriting, journalism, and have spent many hours scribbling down stories in copious notebooks. You're a writer. I have a following of over 13,000 on Instagram. That's good. Uh, that does count for something as far as publishers are concerned. Um, We can talk about that some other time if you're interested. Uh, Where I use my writing to promote self-love and open the conversation about mental health. I use my writing to help readers feel less alone and because I know that somewhere out there, someone feels the same way I do. Yeah, absolutely right. And will gain comfort from my words. I also write because it seems the only time my cat will cuddle me (laughs) is when I have my laptop open. 
Spot on. That's exactly what cats do. <laughs> uh, when I'm not planning stories or begging for love from my cat, you can find me on photo shoots as a plus size model, walking my uh, walking my neighbourhood dogs to R- Richmond Park, and more often than not, listening to music at an unhealthy volume in my yellow car, also known as the Cheese on Wheels. That's colourful to say the least, and uh, to say exactly the same colourful reading. Here it comes, K. For the Love of B by Jessica Still, read by K. Chapter 1. B had two choices. She could stay seated, plump thighs burning and the too narrow for a fat person seat, hurtling 500 miles an hour towards her destiny, or perhaps doom, in Greece. Her second option was breaking down the emergency exit and hauling herself from the plane, hoping for a landing that wouldn't shatter all of her bones. The latter was sounding better and better. Her pulse thrummed in her chest, her throat, her ears, much like it had been for the last two months, the drumming of a tiny, angry army marching its way through her body. She pressed her nose against the window, eyes locked on the rolling land beneath her. Everything looked soft from this high up, like the quilted fields below might actually provide a soft landing and roll her all the way back home to England. No. B collapsed back in her seat, squeezing her tired eyes shut. She had to stick to the plan. If volunteering to support nesting turtles helped her on her way, then that was what she would do. How hard could it be anyway? The photo in her hand was crumpled and sun-faded. There was a B-shaped thumb indent right above the man's eye, the result of weeks spent mindlessly caressing the glossy paper. A habit B wondered if she would ever shake. The photo was still the same as yesterday, and the day before, and the day before that. Nonetheless, she studied it. Fear and something like resentment swirled in her gut. The two people were huddled together in matching blue t-shirts, the word cost printed on the front. The conservation of sea turtles. Was that what love looked like? Strawberry tinted smiles, cheek to cheek. If it was, she had never experienced it. She wasn't even sure it still existed. Swallowing back the sour jealousy that coated her tongue, B flipped the photo over and read the inscription on the back. Me and Stephanos, summer 2001. She tucked the photo back into her pocket and screwed her hands into fists, summoning every ounce of quivering determination from within. There was no turning back. She was going to find him. All she had to do was learn the difference between turtles and tortoises. Clutching her yellow suitcase, Bee stared at the myriad of signs and arrivals, all in a language she didn't understand. She pressed her fingers to her wrist. The thud of her pulse jumped about erratically. If she focused, she was sure it was saying, help me, help me, help me. The cold, chemical-tasting air filled her lungs with a long inhale. It did nothing to quell her trembling nerves. Her legs were like pieces of string billowing in the wind. Tell you what, I need a pint of gat after that flight. What? The boy beside her was broad-shouldered and long-limbed, towering nearly a head above her. Thick clusters of freckles peppered his jaw and his bushy eyebrows were covered by a mass of wavy, toffee-coloured hair that fell in the middle of his forehead like a duck tail. B gulped and said, A pint of what? Gat, the back stuff, you know, Guinness. The lilting softness of his Irish accent made it sound like he was about to sing. Thankfully, he didn't. Undoing the top of his denim jacket, he nodded towards the Conservation of Sea Turtles booklet clutched in her hand. You a volunteer too? B nodded so fast her head nearly fell off. Thank God. Any longer alone and she would have ended up in a ball on the floor. That's grand. Let's go find our sonodos. He wiggled his eyebrows when he said the last word, rolling the sound over his tongue. Slinging her bag over her shoulder, B ran after him as he strode through the crowd. Sin, sin a what? She huffed, stumbling behind. Sinodos. It's Greek for chaperone. B's face contorted. She swallowed back her confusion and picked up her pace, hurrying along to a group of girls huddled at the back of arrivals. 
The tall woman in the blue cost t-shirt had spotted B long before B had spotted her. Her peanut-coloured curly hair, crocheted rainbow cardigan and chub for days attracted immediate attention, much to B's dismay. And uh, Genius Room, nice reading, uh, absolutely very much so. Uh, and Cora, like voice in this, B is coming across well, at least we're starting with the story. Um, Eva is warming to it. Blurb sounds as if there will be quite a bit of indulging, she says in the writing, but pleasantly surprised. It's quite the opposite. Nice voice, says Martin, pacing. I'm totally hooked. Martin, hang your head in shame, really. Uh, Hannah says, like the writing. Jeff says, good, realistic dialogue. Um, Johnny says, ruddy foe, ruddy farrow. What does that mean? Sometimes the genii say stuff that I don't get because it goes straight over my head. That's because they're geniuses and I'm not. What did you think, Lee? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I did like the blurb. I love that last sentence. Yes, I like the idea of having a readership already. That's already it. That's a great. Uh, that's a great start yeah, for definitely. any agent yeah. looking at uh, Ooh, looking at yes. your. Um, and um, Jessica's definitely an expert in what she's in, in, the, in the topic area, so that gives the uh, publisher confidence, definitely. And uh, you know, nice to a little bit of vulnerability there. You know, you don't have to come out about your anxiety or your depression, but mm. um, you know, I, I also suffer from anxiety and depression, and I think that actually being open about it does. Mm. You know, it is is it nice. It takes and, some of the sting uh, out of it, doesn't it? It takes the sting out yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, so I did love the blurb. So the setup is great. So heading into the writing, you know, I was feeling very confident that we were going to get something fairly strong. Um, I, I did, did think the voice was nice. I think there's a little bit of a meander and I just don't love myself a story that starts on a plane. And I don't know why that is. It's, I think because it's so done, um, that whole on a plane, being a bit frightened of being on a plane. I don't, I don't know. Mm quite why and mm. I'm a little bit confused because although the blurb says it's about finding the fa bee's father um, we don't know that from the reading that I can tell I just or maybe I missed it maybe I yeah. just uh, my head slipped over it but it seemed like it could be a boyfriend because this me and you know the look the reading the photo doesn't say it's her mother so I just is that a deliberate mislead I'm not I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's got lots of potential. Um, just, just uh, yeah, and the turtle thing was just fabulous. I just that, hmm. that was really that just made it stand out for me. Yeah, so I could, bit, so I could see it. Just, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple scene, isn't it? But I could definitely see. It. I, was, I was living it along with her. I mean, she made it, she made it come alive for me. I thought I thought the craft was, was pretty good actually. But what did you think, Annie? Hmm. Yeah, I, I also felt it just um, coming alive because I don't know what page we were at that I suddenly I, I remembered, oh, this is something that, that we're reading, this is something that's there on the page. Yeah. Because sometimes you, you're reading something yeah. or you're listening to something and you just get lost in it. And I, that's yeah. the kind of reaction that I was getting. Um, to what Lee said about not knowing if it's about a boyfriend, it's, it's quite sad, but the year was 2001 on the photo. So right. mm. since this is young adult for now, yeah. obviously yeah. 2001, yeah. she would have exactly. had to have labelled it historical, which is yeah. quite scary to think about. Yeah. Um, no, but I think I think she did a really good job at just setting up um, everything from the dad to this potential love interest, and we kind of get a sense, obviously, of what she's like, and also who who this Irish boy is like as well. So. I think for me, she's just ticking all the boxes. I think it's really a really good start. That's excellent. That's excellent. Let's just go back to Lee for a moment. And yes, you have pushed your button. I was just going to chide you, but you don't need chiding because you've done it. And um, we got a 71. We got a 71, which is going to produce a very interesting situation there. Um, I, I, I totally agree with Ancor, Ancor the, the last comment in the genius room there. I liked it, but no idea what chub for days meant. That puzzled me. Chub for days. Chub is, is stuff that they throw in water to attract sharks. What does that mean, chub for days? It's disturbing. Maybe it's a misprint, but I don't know what for. Oh, I've got to be worrying about that now. Jessica, please let me know, please. Um, it looks like... I tell you what, let's have a look at the overall scorecard now. 
after we've had five submissions. I think it's going to be close. Oh, it is. Look how interesting. So we all think that the blurb from Jessica's was great and the craft from Jessica was great. But we think the title from Andrew was great and the commercial potential from Andrew was great too, which actually means that Andrew and Jessica would duke it out there for the top spot on the show. But Andrew has just pipped Jessica. He's got an extremely respectable 75, which means that you, Andrew, yes! <laughs> ah. Well done, Andrew. Gotta say, you're gonna have to share that credit, I think. It's not, I mean, it's mostly you, but it's not entirely you. Because part of it was Johnny's reading, wasn't it? <laughs> I think so. We love Johnny's reading. So I've just got a got a minor announcement um, to uh, to tell you. Next week's show is going to be different, possibly even more exciting than this week's show because I'm not going to be here. Uh, but there will be a show next week, and I'll tell you what we're going to be doing. It'll be a, a YouTube premiere, so please come along exactly the same time, five o'clock, and be ready to exercise your, your the wit and wisdom for which the Genius Room is justly renowned. Um, we're doing something rather different, though. It's, we're not looking at five submissions. What we're looking at is an area that pop-up submissions has, I guess, if, if truth be told, actually rather sadly neglected um, for the past several years, and that is poetry. And the reason we've neglected it is that you hear it from me, you hear it from publishers, you poets out there must be sick of hearing it. That, well, you know, poetry doesn't really sell, so we can't consider it. Well, we are having an in-depth, really interesting, um, elbows on the table, sleeves rolled up conversation with a poet who has sold 250,000 copies, not in paperback, but in hardback. An extraordinary commercial success, really extraordinary. And we're also getting all kinds of interesting detail about how did you do it, what do the publishers do, what do they expect? They only expect to sell 2,000 copies maximum. They ended up selling 250,000 copies. So uh, we're also hoping actually to get the poet along as well in the YouTube live chat room. So you will be able to interact with them and you know ask some questions in addition to anything that uh, that's covered on the show. So I hope that's going to keep you nicely interested and amused for, for next week. And we're paying kind of paying our dues to poetry because we haven't covered them very much. Uh, and then business as normal the week after. I want to say thank you so much to Lee. Thank you so much to Annie. Thank you so much to Kate and Rachel and, of course, Emily, who corrals, inspires and generally organises all our wonderful narrators. And most of all, thank you to you for continuing to write. Where would life be without you? See you. I will see you in two weeks' time. But remember, next week, it's all about poetry. Oh, the world's a stage. Welcome to the show. I glance at you, you smile.